Hello there, it's me, Teacher Mike from Phuket Pals. I hope you're all well today. Um, welcome to video five of this GED Social Studies course. Um, in this one, we're going to be looking at the structure and design of the U.S. federal government. Okay, so it says here the structure of the U.S. federal government is based on a principle called separation of powers. So this is a key word for you, separation of powers. If you don't know that already, you should be taking notes for, uh, on this in your in your notebook. Um, the U.S. Constitution divides the federal government into three branches. We have the executive branch, which is the president, the legislative branch, which is Congress, and the judicial branch, which is the court system. In this way, the power is divided. Okay, now why do they do this? Why do they divide this federal the federal government up into these three slices, these three bits? Well, it's just to prevent a concentration of power um, in any one area. Okay, so if you think about the first area, which is the executive branch, okay, so this is the this is the president and his close advisors and his cabinet. Okay, his cabinet they are the people who are the head of each area. So like the um, the head of the armed forces, um, sorry, the head of foreign policy. Apologies, the head of foreign policy or the head of whatever it is. You know these different areas that, uh, that the federal government take care of. Um, is the president's cabinet will advise him directly on on these matters. So you've got the executive, you have the legislative branch, which is the law-making body. That's where laws are discussed and made, which is uh, Congress. Okay, now Congress consists of two different parts. There's two, two parts of Congress. There's the House of Representatives, and there is the, there is the Senate. We'll come on to those in later lessons as well. Then there is the judicial branch, also known as the judiciary, um, which is the court system. Okay, so basically the judicial branch contains the top, the top judges, in the U.S. and uh, yeah, that's that's what the it's all about. Now, if you, I always say, if you think about how power is structured in the U.S. in general, think of it like a wedding cake. Okay, so a wedding cake has multiple layers. Going up like that, the very top layer. Think about the very top layer. This is the federal government at the very very top. There's no higher, no higher power, no higher political power or legal power in the U.S. than the federal government. Okay, um. If you could, like I say, as we'll learn later lessons, that there's also state government and there's also local government. Okay, these are di again different layers of our, our wedding cake we're thinking about. But the very top layer is the federal government, and the federal government itself is divided into three bits. Okay, now as we said before in lesson four, this is uh, this is it's called the federal government because it comes from the concept of federalism or the, the concept of limiting power, dividing power up. So power doesn't get concentrated in the hands of one group or one person. And then you have a, a dictatorship or uh, some form of despotism. Um, <clears throat> so this division of power, as we, I just said, prevents any one branch of government from having too much power. It also means that if one branch abuses its power, the other two are available to restrain it. <clears throat> okay. So for example, um, let's say, let's say... Okay, let's say a president vetoes a proposed law. Okay, so if a president, if, if a law gets passed through Congress, uh, it gets through uh, the judiciary and everything else, it goes, and then it comes to the president for, you know, for stamping, for rubber stamping to become law. If the president says no to that, then it can actually be voted uh, into law automatically by Congress. If I think it's if they vote for a two thirds majority, uh, they can actually. Uh, overturn the president's veto, which is a very unique uh, way to limit the president, president's power. So that's a good example. That's a good example of how Congress can kind of uh, bite back, I suppose, against an overly powerful uh, or ambitious, you could say, uh, president. And um, so all of these sections, like the judiciary, the, the Congress, and also the executive, they all have these types of powers uh, to overrule each other's decisions or make things awkward for each other. And that's why it's very, very difficult in the US to get a law passed because it has to go through so many different parts. So you have to go through, has to go through the two houses of, um, of Congress, has to go through the House of, House of Representatives, has to go through the, uh, the Senate, uh, has to go through the, the judiciary, has to go through the executive as well. And only at the end of that process, a process that's sometimes known as the, 
the corridor of legislation. Only if it gets to the end of the corridor of legislation and it's rubber stamped, oh, then it becomes law. But that's very many, many, many uh, proposed proposed laws, known as bills. Many many bills get lost in this corridor of legislation are never seen again. Okay, so each branch checks the power of the other two. This is known as a system of checks and balances. Okay, key term here. It's important to learn this one checks and balances. This division of government into three branches was first proposed by the French political philosopher Montesquieu in the 18th century. So again, like we've discussed in previous videos, the founding fathers, when they brought, when they were um, conjuring up this idea of what the, the United States government would look like and the constitution, they, they cast their eye back into history, into, you know, ancient to the ancient governments of Greece and Rome. They also were very well read in their, their political philosophy. So they knew their, as we said before, they knew their John Locke, they knew their Montesquieu, they would have known their Hume, um, and all the rest of those fantastic political philosophers that um, have, uh, that, you know, that have influenced uh, politics throughout the ages. Um, yeah, so Montesquieu himself, here he is, the French, French philosopher, he believed that this division of power promoted liberty or freedom. Uh, the idea of separation of powers is one of the main components of the modern constitutional government. Okay, so there you have it. You have separation of powers, which is based on the idea of federalism or limiting as centralized governmental power. And you have the system of checks and balances where each, uh, for example, in the federal government, each of the three branches can uh, make, make life difficult for each other and uh, put up a kind of stop sign um, to legislation going through or any ideas going through. And uh, it just means you have this kind of, uh, it means that if a law does get through the federal government, it does get stamped, it means it's going to be very well thought out, very well reasoned. And also uh, it will have been, if it was, if it had any, any flaws at all, it's, it's going to have been picked up by one of the three branches and, uh, and discussed further. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. Okay, so here's the, here's the system of checks and balances, in essence, okay? So here's the legislative branch, which is Congress, as we said before, the law-making body in the USA. In there you have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate. Okay, now the, the House of Representatives, if we dig a little deeper, in the, in the House of Representatives, you have uh, you have representatives from uh, you have representatives from I think there's about four hundred over about four hundred and fifty or so about four hundred and fifty or so representatives in the House, and they're they're elected they're elected to get there. Now um, they are they're they for example let's say the the Democratic Party. Uh, let's say there were 70 percent of democratic candidates got voted into the house of representatives well that that would that would be okay you don't have a uh, there's not an equal balance um for each state within the house of representatives okay so uh, in the house of Rep representatives uh, states with bigger populations uh will have more representatives for them okay so there's there's kind of an uneven balance so Smaller states um, have less political power within the House of Representatives because they will have uh, fewer representatives to represent their state's uh, desires and needs, okay? Now with the Senate itself, within the Senate, the other house here of the Congress, in there you have a hundred senators and there, with the 50 states of the US, there's two, two senators for each state. So this provides a balance with the House of Representatives because um, you know, if you only had the House of Representatives, it means that the, the the more populous, the more populated states would have a lot more power uh, with making laws. But with the Senate being able to balance that and check against the power of the House of Representatives, it means that smaller states are even represented at this uh, at this lawmaking stage. <clears throat> okay, so the House and the Senate can veto each other's bills. Okay, so again, that provides balance because let's say a stronger state. In the House of Representatives, thinks something should become law. Well, in the Senate, maybe they say, "No, well, that that's not the case. We don't think that's the case." So they can vote against it directly and challenge 
the, the House of Representatives uh, views and, and vice versa. OK, um, <clears throat> over here, here's the executive branch, the president and his close advisors. It says here, Congress approves presidential nominations and controls the budget. It, pass, it can pass laws over the president's veto and it can impeach the president and remove him from office. So there, you can see how powerful Congress actually is. It can actually impeach or remove a president, a, an unlawful, let's say, a president who's broken the law or one who's being uh, disingenuous, shall we say, he's being dishonest. The, uh, Congress can actually boot him out, they can kick him out of, of office. office. Um, Congress also, if the, if, uh, yeah, if there's a, a nomination for president, Congress approves that and they control the budget. So they have, they, they have control of the purse strings of the country. Um, so here is the, the president himself, the executive branch. This is the executive office of the president and the cabinet department, okay? Independent government agencies. Um, again, president can veto con congressional legislation. So if a piece of legislation, if a bill, goes through the Senate, goes through the House of Representatives, and they think it's all good, well, the president can still veto that. But as I said earlier, that can be then checked again, because if the president vetoes this, and it's already been passed here, it'll go back again like a ping pong ball, and these guys can actually get together and uh, overturn the veto with a two-thirds majority. So there's constant play, uh, play, interplay between these uh, branches. Next, if we look down the executive branch, uh, the president nominates the judges, okay, um, also with the judicial branch, as we said, it's the, the court system, the highest courts in the land, the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal and District Courts, uh, they can declare presidential acts unconstitutional. So again, if the president is not playing ball, shall we say, um, the judicial branch can look up all their dusty old law books and decide that's actually uh, not in accordance with our the Constitution of the USA. So, uh, yeah, you need to sort it out, Mr. President. Okay, so also the judicial branch can declare laws unconstitutional. So the judicial branch are keeping an eye on Congress and whether they are um, in line with uh, the US Constitution and with, with their lawmaking. They can also keep the president in check with, uh, with what he's doing in, in accordance with the Constitution. Now, the Senate confirms the president's nominations, Congress can impeach judges and remove them from office, okay? So although the president can appoint the highest judges in the land to the Supreme Court, Congress can actually remove any of these judges from office if they think they're not uh, acting in the best interests of the country, okay? And is that it? That's it, yeah, so that's how the system of checks and balances works. As I said, it's quite, it's relatively complicated and you need to know for the GED social studies test, you need to have a good idea of these things. OK, this this question types of question come up all the time about checks and balances. Um, so know the three branches, know um, how they can, what they can do and how they can check each other and how the system balances itself out. OK, so each of the three three branches of government serves as a, a, a distinct purpose. We've, we've already talked about this, but we'll read through again. The legislative branch, which is Congress, makes the laws. The executive branch is the president and the members of his or her administration and the cabinet. The president is elected separately from the members of Congress. The executive branch is responsible for enforcing the laws. It also has the power to veto acts of Congress, thus limiting the power of the legislative branch. The judicial branch, which is the court system, is responsible for interpreting the law okay so that is about it that's about it so um yeah i hope that helped you today and um, that's a little bit we did a little bit of a separation of powers a little bit of checks and balances and then we dug a little deeper um with checks and balances with this diagram which makes things kind of a little bit easier with the visual component okay so i hope this video helped you i'm teacher mike from phuket pals i'll see you in the next video have a good day Bye bye